Hello, and welcome to this problem-solving video on superposition and interference of sound waves. Um, it's actually also a derivation of two-slit interference in disguise, but to set up the problem, we're just thinking about some gigantic room in which we've put two speakers at one end, and then there's some concert or whatever that's playing over the speakers, and we have unfortunately got some really cheap seats all the way at the back, We'd like to know, is there a place that we could sit so that we could still actually um, have some hope of hearing anything? So our best bet would be to sit where we're going to get perfectly constructive interference from these two speakers and get basically the loudest possible sound as a result. So how are we going to figure this out? Where do we need to sit? Well, in order to set this up, we've got to think about this hint right here. So pretend that the opposite wall is far away. And let's think about why we need to do that. So draw a little room, put some speakers in there. There they are. If I think about it being short, well, then the two speakers are sending their waves like this. If I make it a little bit different, then they're sending them like that. So why do we care about what these paths are? Because of course, for interference, it's the path difference between how far two waves travel that gives rise to a phase difference and possibly makes them um, interfere destructively, as opposed to staying in phase. As they start in phase, they progress. There's some different distance that one travels, and that results in either constructive or destructive interference. So we need to be able to assess what that difference is in order to figure out what's going to happen. So in order to do that, let's think a little bit about this room and use this hint. So the farther I make that point go, things actually become a little bit better. So here's a nice diagram. So as I take this point off and off and off and off, you see that the paths of each um, wave to that point of intersection far off now, way above the screen, um, these rays or these paths become basically parallel. Okay, so we're going to use this idea and apply it over here. So if we take this um, rays and basically put their point of intersection far away, then let's go ahead and do that. So here we go, and here we go. There are two parallel rays. Okay, and I'll just draw this extra one in here from the center. Okay, and there's the center line. I'll just draw that on too. That'll be useful later. But right now, let's think about this angle theta. Well, that angle theta is also this angle theta. Um, so this little one in here. And I can draw a perpendicular to that. And the reason that I've drawn this perpendicular is because from here on out, these two rays are doing the same thing. They're parallel, they go off to the same point, they're going to be the same length. If they're the same length, then only this little bit of the distance traveled by this ray, or this wave rather, is going to matter in terms of what happens uh, for phase difference going from here to here. That sets up the phase difference between these waves and it stays the same since the rest of this distance is the same for both. So if we start in phase here, and then we end up in phase again here, then from here on out, they'll stay in phase. So what is this distance? Well, if this little angle right in there was theta, then I can make a triangle that has a right angle and then with the actual ray, that's clearly 90 minus theta. Let's put an arrow. So that one's 90 minus theta in there, this angle. Because this whole one with respect to the dashed line is 90 degrees, and the small teeny tiny bit was also theta. So then if this is 90 minus theta, this one is a right angle, then this one is also theta. And that's very useful because then I know that this side of the triangle, looking here, well, for this triangle, is 
A, the hypotenuse, and B, it's also the same distance as this distance between the speakers. So we'll call that distance D, and that makes this side of the triangle D sine theta. Okay. So that's our diagram. D sine theta is our difference in distance. We want them to end up in phase. So if this thing comes out as a peak here, we want it to be a peak there, so that then as they move, they stay together. In order for this distance to keep a peak being a peak, that distance must be some integer multiple of the wavelength. Okay, if we wanted destructive interference, if we wanted to know where definitely not to sit, then we would want it to shift it a peak into a trough, which means a shift of one half of a wavelength. So we could write this thing for the destructive and this one for constructive interference. All right, so this is the case we're interested in. Where should we sit? So then we've got that d sine theta, or really sine theta, is just going to be n lambda on d. So d we know, lambda we don't. Or do we? We've been given the frequency, and we know that v is equal to f lambda. So we know that lambda is just v on f. We can put that in here, and v on f on d. Do we know v? Well, we're talking about sound waves. This is a speaker. It's emitting sound waves. So the speed of sound in air is basically 340 meters per second. f is 300 hertz. So we know those values. We know d. And n is just whatever integer we like until we get all the way across the far wall. How are we going to turn it into a distance? Well, let's come back to our diagram. Let's talk about the distance with respect to the center. So we'll call that x. This distance on this side of the triangle is some capital D. Okay, that's theta, which means x is the opposite, d is the adjacent. So we know that tangent of theta is x on capital D. And now there's one extra bit. So we know that we're taking this thing to be very far away. If that's true, then d is very much larger than x, which makes the angle theta small. If the angle theta is small, then we know a couple of things. We know that sine of theta just turns into the angle itself. We know that cosine of theta goes to 1. And tangent of theta is sine, on theta, sine of theta on cosine theta. So tangent of theta also turns into just theta. So this thing is theta. So theta is x on d. But this sine of theta is also a theta. So theta is all this stuff. So now we've got x on d is equal to n on d v on f. So the position x from the center of the room that we need to sit at is just n v on f little d times capital D. Okay, and if we want to put numbers in, then we may as well do that. So we've got n 340 d was 100 little d was 3 f is 300. So that's our combination. So we'll get rid of two zeros. Okay, so we've got 340 divided by 9. That's meters. And it's actually 340 n meters from the center. So this is saying that at this far side of the room is the center. If n equals 0, that's a good place to be. So that's a good place. And then if n equals 1, x is equal to 340 divided by 9. Um, meters. Or n could equal 2. So we could be sitting at, um, sorry, 680. 
divided by 9 meters, and those should be evenly spaced across this wall, and similarly down this negative side going to the left of the wall, and so on until we spread out across the entire room. So we've now found all the points where we expect constructive interference from these speakers. Okay, hopefully you found that video helpful and now understand how to treat superposition, think about interference, and how to actually work with these kind of triangles to figure out what the distances are. Um, so yeah, hopefully that was helpful.